Well, uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Chris, Chris Bergen, and Jennifer Rodriguez, my wife and assistant here. And uh, then we're going to be talking about uh, 19th century photography. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the photographic processes, the, you know, the science and the, the chemistry behind photography, although neither of us are anti-practicing photographers, so uh, that's really not our strong point. What we're going to be talking about is the study, uh, what looking at the 19th century images can tell us about uh, history and culture uh, during the Victorian period. So uh, I'm going to go to our first slide. And uh, what I want to talk about here for introductions, the case that just came up uh, about a month or two ago. It's of uh, this gentleman that's, that's come on, I'm going to get to several images of parts of him here in this montage, uh, the upper left and right there. It's a little bit of a gory story, so I think to drop this on you just had a nice dinner. But this gentleman's name is Phineas P. Gage. And he was actually a railroad worker in the 1840s. And What's interesting about the story is that nobody knew who he was, and that's one of the wonderful things about studying 19th century photography. Sometimes you can stumble across an image of somebody, and you have no idea who it is, and sometimes the mystery of figuring out what's the story behind the picture. And often, especially in the early photographs in the 1840s, 1850s, 1860s, you know, if there was a prop piece used in the photograph, it was normally important, because it wasn't until the later 1860s, 1870s, people really started to loosen up and have fun with the camera. Uh, during the 1840s, 1850s, these are mostly studio images that are being taken of individuals, and normally it was a very serious, very formal affair. Um, getting dressed for a photographer was a, was a popular period term. You know, wear your best clothes, or if you're an occupational person, you know, you'd have the tools of your trade, but then you know, you'd still be dressed as nicely as you could normally to really show off for the, uh, the you know, for the camera. You really want to look your best when you're getting your, your likeness taken, your, your photograph taken with this new process that was still fairly expensive. And when the first picture, the one that's in the metal case that her uh, on your upper left up there turned out, uh, that was in the, the private collector's hands. And um, according to what they say, they didn't know who he was or what it was he was holding in his hand. He's got this sort of metal spear-like thing. As they always like to call it, well, a picture of a, of a, of a, of a whale harpoon, with this harpoon, is what they called it. And they were talking about, I guess they posted an image of it on some internet forum. Again, this was just a couple months ago, this was in the fall of 2009. And somebody said, Oh, well, um, that doesn't look like a harpoon. And somebody else said, well, maybe it's Phineas Gage. <coughs> and people in the medical uh, studies, uh, Phineas Gage is actually a really interesting person. He was the first person to survive neuro neurosurgery. He was a railroad employee in the 1840s. And that thing that he's shown holding his hands, they were actually able to later identify that is indeed Phineas Gage, is actually a tamping rod, an iron tamping rod. And what that would be used for, this is back in the 1800s when they'd be, you know, he was actually a railroad employee and he'd be blowing up boulders and things to make ready for the path for the rail tracks. Well, you pack gunpowder down a hole and use this big iron rod to pack it down. Now, unfortunately, one of the things that happens when you crush gunpowder like that is it can go off. And that's what happened to poor Mr. Gage. Again, not to be too graphic here, but that iron rod flew out of his hands and went straight through his head. And you can actually see, there's actually a picture. This skull is in a uh, museum in Massachusetts um, of, uh, of medicine. And you can actually see his skull, and it's still been shattered like that. But he survived the wound. Um, he was in horrible pain, but apparently he never passed out. His co-workers took him to nearest town. And uh, there, a doctor, uh, John M. Uh, Hammond, and his Harlow, you can see down there, the bearded gentleman below, actually performed the first successful neurosurgery. And he was actually able, I don't know exactly the details of it, but he was actually able to stop the bleeding, stabilize Mr. Gage, and uh, get him going again. Now, the funny thing is, is that part of his brain was destroyed, the frontal lobes. And uh, Harlow and some of his, uh, Mr. Gage's friends noted his personality did change afterwards. Um, whereas beforehand, Mr. Gage was noted as being a very soft-spoken, very kind, very warm individual that uh, afterwards he was sort of crude in his language and very quick to become angry and things like that. And uh, so it's really the first documented case of personality change from brain injury. And uh, Mr. Gage later moved to California during the gold rush and uh, actually uh, died of uh, seizures in 1860 in San Francisco. And is actually buried at Cypress Lawn Cemetery. And uh, but again, and then later on, just in this last couple months, the early part of this year, the second image we have over on the right here surface of Mr. Gage. And uh, apparently that's a, that's a CDD, a current disease, uh, which I think spelled in several different ways we discovered. Well, the is the correct way over. That is a CDD, and apparently a couple of those are actually in uh, the, 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 the hands of the family, the Gage family. 
So these two separate images, probably both taken at the same time, because he's wearing the same outfit of him with his trusty camping hat, and that's where he became a souvenir. And at the very top there, you can actually see that camping rod. It is still it is in that museum in, uh, in Boston, where they have uh, Mr. Gage's uh, skull and his uh, death cats there. So again, that's one of those, this is just a little leader in there, stories that these photographs can sometimes tell us. And you look at it and say, well, it's just an old picture. I, mean, I don't know who this person is or whatever like that. But sometimes with enough detective work and luck, you can actually figure out who these people are and can you know, help round out the story of you know, American history. So we move on. So now we're going to talk about the photographic processes. Uh, we start off with the daguerreotype. Uh, that was invented by a Frenchman, uh, Jacques Daguerre, in the late 1830s. And um, this would actually let you capture an image on a polished plate of copper. It would be copper that would be covered with a silver halide formula. And um, the you know, image would actually be exposed to the sunlight. And whatever was you know, in the picture would be captured on that. And the weird thing about that is it's actually a negative image. But it looks positive because you know, the way the, the parts of the silver become dark. And I think go to the next frame and actually see one. This is actually the, one of the, the first Gary type images. Uh, called Etienne de l'Artiste, the studio of the artist in 1837. And you can see it's actually more of a still life, uh, but showing the various things he had sitting around in his art studio here. But uh, again, this is, you know, this is really something new. You have to be able to capture these images um, using uh, you know, this, this new technology. And uh, so at first it was very artistic, you know, it was very expensive, it was very involved. The exposure times were you know, sometimes well over a minute. And uh, so it was, a, it was something that was very cumbersome. And it took a while for it to become streamlined and something other people were doing. And uh, the gear was never granted a patent or anything like that. And so there were a bunch of competitive people all trying to figure out how to do the, the photographic process. And in the 1840s, it started to spread throughout Europe to the United States. And um, by the late 1840s, it was, it was here and here to stay. Bring them on. Now, the next uh, photographic process to come out was called the amber type. And this was actually, it was similar to the, uh, the, the Gary type, when we started using the silver formula, now we're using a collodion process on, um, on glass. And the, it's actually a mixture of coral bromide, iodine salt, dissolved in collodion, which is a solution alcohol, alcohol and peroxylin. Put that on the glass and expose that. And the exposure times here, you know, were, you know several, several seconds before it was being exposed. And then you wash it in a, to, to, to fix it, um, you wash a solution of water, iron, sulfate, alcohol, and acetic acid. And um, one of the things, and that's one of the things of all these uh, photographic processes, it's really hard to say exactly what the exposure times were because they depend on the amount of light. Um, these were all done with daylight, so you had to have natural lighting. Uh, they were not doing really artificial light for this. And you know, it was really an art. You had to be able to, as a photographer, look and say, okay, it's a bright sunny day, I need to show it the plate for this long, or it's a cloudy day, or it's early in the morning, it's late in the evening. And, uh, and, and do a longer exposure. But the thing is, if you do longer exposure, you can have a more of a fuzz on the canvas. Does it also sometimes depend as well on how the chemical mix? Uh, probably. Um, you know, that's I don't know. Again, I don't know enough about the chemistry today or the chemistry then to say for certain. Okay. But um, yeah, because that's I mean, it was one thing too. You're probably not sure, especially in the early days when it was still so much in our, you know, what exactly, you know, what exactly portion of these chemicals you mix together too. And I'm sure different photographers probably had different blends that you Well, even in studio images, I mean, they're dependent, so highly dependent upon the natural light, that they've often got skylights and whatnot mm -hmm. rigged up in these buildings, so they can just pull these things back to try to flood the facility with light. And that's, you know, when you look at how it develops, without it, forget it, you're just gonna end up with a dark negative image. And that's not gonna get you anywhere. But yeah. if you overexpose them, and you put too much light into the room, and especially a confined space like that, you end up with this whitewashed, almost gray image where nothing shows up. Yeah. So you know, it becomes a delicate balance. And to, to watch them, you know, to see this done, it's almost like a, uh, oh God, what are those old photographs with the shape? Uh, Polaroid. You can actually watch it when you run the solution over the image, over the glass plate, and the image just pops right out. Yeah.